Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Today we have a special webinar taking place. It's called First Nation Languages. And um, the focus of today's webinar is on two of Ontario's prominent First Nation languages, which are Ojibwe and Cree. And we have two facilita facilitators today working with us. Our first presenter is going to be Maria Zil Juncker. And she is a professor at the School of Linguistics and language studies at Carleton University. So she has done a lot of research and work in language documentation. Uh, she specializes in Aboriginal languages, especially Cree. And she's done a lot of work with information and communication technologies and using those for language preservation. She also has interests in general linguistics, cognitive semantics, cross-cultural communication, empowerment, and uh, French. So she's going to be our first presenter today, and she's going to talk to you about uh, Cree language families, and she's going to do a small introduction on the Linguistic Atlas, which is a really useful online tool. Following her, we will have Alan Corbier, and Alan Corbier is from Chiging First Nation. He has a bachelor's degree in science from the University of Toronto. He studied at York University and earned his master's in environmental studies. His focus was particularly in, in Anishinaabe narrative and Anishinaabe language revitalization. He previously worked as the executive director for the Ojibwe Cultural Foundation, and now Alan is working at um, Lakeview School in Chigang First Nation, where he heads the uh, Anishinaabe Mwen Revival Program. So after Maria Dill is finished, he'll be talking to you about Ojibwe language and orthographies, and he'll have a presentation as well. Um, so I will let Maria Dill start, and if you have any questions, just let us know by using the chat. Okay. Tansi Wajie, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so what you see on the screen is a, is a map of Ontario with the different First Nation languages spoken in Ontario. And the different colors represent different language families, so that's just a rough introduction. But basically, um, what you see in uh, the first top part, so uh, purple, blue, green, and uh, dark purple are called Algonquian languages. So not Algonquian written with a I, but with a I and a A N. And that's the big mother family uh, for all those languages. So it contains Cree, contains Ojibwe, and as I'll explain later, because that's the languages I'm more familiar with, it contains also other languages. It stretches itself from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Rockies. Another big language family we have that shows up in Ontario are the Iroquoian languages. Uh, they're more in the south and up here at the bottom of the map. And of course we have Mohawk, uh, Oneida, and then what is uh, currently called as Six Nations, Iroquois, so Seneca, Cayuga, etc. Um, they're all part of these uh, Six Nations down here. I will not say much more about these because it's really not my uh, specialty. Uh, so I'll worry about the Ojibwe, the green languages, and the blue ones up, up here. Uh, for the rest of this presentation. But before I go ahead, if you're interested in finding out about uh, Aboriginal languages and how well there's, I mean, how many speakers and how many people are involved, you can go to Statistic Canada. Unfortunately, the 2011 census, I want to warn you, is inadequate because what happened for Ontario is that there were forest fires at the time in Ontario. So when you look at the summary, they say, for instance, that Cree languages are not represented in Ontario, and that's totally wrong. Okay, there are lots and lots of Cree speakers in Ontario, or people who come from Cree speaking community, as you know. It's just that the census uh, did not survey those people. So be really careful when you use uh, census data. Okay, so all of this has not really is not really useful for you for Ontario because it is not it is not correct. Okay, so going to something maybe um, more interesting for you uh, from the perspective of languages, this is a website that was developed in collaboration with Aboriginal communities across the country um, in the goal of, of bridging over provincial boundaries and, and having people who all belong to the same language family are 
cousin languages if you want to realize that they're connected and that the artificial divisions that has have been brought upon them by colonialism actually are artificial divisions because they do share a lot in common in terms of uh, mother tongue or original language so this is just Algonquian, the Algonquian I mentioned to you that has an A not to be confused with the uh, little Algonquian that is uh, spoken here no. uh, by, uh, in Kitigan Zibi or in Golden Lake, we don't have Golden Lake here on the this is in Quebec, but Golden Lake would be in Ontario, we don't have it on the map yet. Um, uh, this is not representing all the communities, of course not, it's representing uh, a, a very large sample of languages with major dialectal variations. So, um, uh, if you click here on the legend, you can see the different languages that are represented you see that we have, uh, these are all from the Algonquian language family, Blackfoot being really like the black sheep of the family, they're very different. Um, Mi'kmaq and, uh, we don't have uh, Mali said, but it's coming, would be Eastern Algonquian, they're down here, and they are very different as well. But the other ones that you see here, Ojibwe and Cree, are called Central Algonquian. We also have Michif, which is quite different, as you know. But you don't need to worry about Michif in Ontario. So when you, when you are in Ontario, really what you have is Ojibwe, which Alan will de describe in detail in a minute. And then you have uh, Cree. And I will give you some examples. Um, there is a little exercise that I had prepared for you. Okay, just, uh, I'm not, not going to talk about writing systems yet. Let me just uh, move that. Okay, so what I wanted to, you to do, and this is a little activity, which by the way, you can download on the Linguistic Atlas here. Um, actually, this one has been updated a bit. So, how do we know those languages are part of one big family? Well, it's because um, uh, what linguists do is they compare, the same way they know that French and Italian and, and German and English are somehow connected long, long ago because they say padre, uh, father, père, uh, somehow we can connect all those sounds together to the same root. Well, you can do the same with, uh, of course, languages in North America and the Algonquian languages. Um, what we know is that there was an original R sound in the mother language that changed over time, and we can hear in the different daughters' languages. So if I go, this little exercise asks you to go and pick the weather category, and you'll, you're quickly going to understand how that works. So um, this is based on a conversation um, uh, CD and manual for that was adapted for all those languages. So we're comparing little conversation phrases. So if you go to the weather and you pick it's windy, then what you have on the screen is the different ways that all those people say it is windy. So if I start say with my um, with the Inu, no. you notice they say Newton, right? But if I go to the East Newton. Screen Quebec, Newton. All right, so, but then if I go say, uh, haha, in Moose Cree, you hear an L, right? Remember where the neighbors were? And if you go to Swampy Cree, Nootin. so that's Atawapiska, they'll say Nootin, but in Moose Cree, they will say Nootin. So you may have heard people speaking about the L dialect and the N dialect and the Y dialect and so on. This is why this is like that. Now look, we have the Atikameka particularly interesting. Because they, Rudin. they're the only one who still have an R. Rudin. Okay, so the colors you see on the map are largely based on those broad um, distinctions. They were used, there was also some political divisions, but there is a linguistic background behind the fact that those people were mutually intelligible and they felt they were part of the same group and and so because they have a way of pronouncing, so if you go now to, um, no, Blackfoot will be totally different. So as I said, Blackfoot is very different, but. You can. Okay, this is um, plain Cree, typically called the Y dialect. And then uh, in, in the Hindu, we have a funny phenomena, which is that in um, Pesamit, Pesamit, they write it with an N, notice, but they say. Luden. Lutin, like the Muscri. 
okay? Um, I'll come back to that. The Innu have the, the Innu are the Greens here in Quebec and Labrador, because they had to talk to each other, read each other across two official languages. They're actually the most advanced in developing a standard orthography. They have one standard orthography for all the Innu dialect, even though she says Luton, Luton. and they say Newton, they write it the same way. Okay, so this was uh, to show you one of the major Cree continuum division. The other one um, was the other little exercise that I had in mind for you, and uh, that's the palatalization. So for those of you who maybe have traveled in, in, in Europe or, you know, in the north of France, things are called Chateauneuf, uh, Newcastle, but in the south of France, the same place name called Newcastle is called Castelnau. Well, what you hear at the beginning is the difference between K and CH. And this is called palatalization. Um, Castel is the original Latin, uh, what, which you find in Spanish. It's the most conservative pronunciation. And then what happened um, in the north of France is that the K became a CH, became a CH. You see the same in Algonquian languages. So if I take, um, like I suggest you take a number of things, but we're going to take your book. So we're going to go to the school category. And by the way, this atlas could be, if you're in a, in a community that wants to revitalize the language and they're really at the beginner stage and they want to make some efforts and for people who no longer speak, they can use this atlas um, for a start and everything is downloadable and is available for free. Okay, so at the school, so let's listen. Jimson Hagen. Okay. Gimson in here Aha, what do you see? There is these guys say ch. Gimson Hagen. Samahanigan. They say ch. Notice how they write it TSH here, whereas these guys write it CH. And then these guys will write it with a C. Oh no no, she says k. Sorry. Um they'll say k. Okay. So when you click around here, let's speak Nascapi for a change. Okay. What you see is there is really an Ontario Quebec difference, except for the Atikamek who kind of stay with the Ontario. But there is a line here between Quebec and Ontario. And people who are on the Quebec side, minus the Atikamek, they all pronounce this with a ch. These are called the palatalized dialect. Whereas everybody else west say k. No, except the mischief, of course, we say something very French, ton livre. Um, not all the mischief, though. But she says the k, the you, ton livre. Mischief is interesting, but. So this is Ojibwe. Right, that's uh, again Ojibwe, and I believe. Right. So different orthography, but pretty much the k sound uh, stays on the west. So this is the, the other major dialectal difference within Algonquian, the Cree, uh, and even Oji no, Ojibwe, you're all so saying something like k and g, Alan, right? So um, it's the uh, palatalized dialects on the right and non-palatalized dialects on the left. Now, why would that be important for you librarians? I think it's a quick way for you to tell if the book you have in your, or the material you have in your library um, may not come from, may not represent the language of the people you're trying to serve. Um, uh, what else can I? OK, so um, talking now about orthography a little bit. Um, where if you if you're still on the linguistic atlas, there are a number of buttons uh, that would be kind of a good startup resource. So, classroom has those activities I showed you. Download is where you can download conversation manuals, but also especially uh, sound files. I'll make a quick demonstration of how you can do that. So, say we want to study the weather, and say uh, so. I'm going to drag that here, and then if I want to. 
because it's possible people come to your library and they go to the site but they don't understand how that works so if you can show it to them that would be great and then you can pick the languages that you are interested in so why why don't we pick Moose Cree because we want to learn uh, in Ontario okay and then why don't we pick also whoops did Moose Cree not go Oh, what about uh, so, voila, OG Cree, and maybe um, a swampy. We should take my Marie Louayatel from Ottawa Piscat, okay? And then maybe, maybe just because you you want to know what is in English, you can stick the English there, and you can put it in any order you like. You're gonna create a sound file. Um, Like this okay and then you you're done and then here I have an mp3 which is a download of that particular category for all those languages that I picked and I can then put that on my iPod or my iPhone and listen to it okay and basically it's gonna play each sentences I mean I can open it it's raining Him one. Him one. Everyone, it's snowing. Miss Pun, so the pun, so this pun, it's windy. No tin, no tin, no tin. All right, so, um, maybe I say a few things about the orthography. So the, you, oh, you can go to mobile version, you can download, so for some of these we have apps, so you, people can take apps and so on. Um, but what's maybe more important for revitalization is also uh, the resources. Um, um, right now, these, there are a number of dictionaries that share a common uh, digital infrastructure, and uh, it's actually a project that's ongoing, but we're developing all those different dictionaries. And what is of interest for you is the uh, Fort Severn Dictionary and the uh, Spoken Creek Glossary. So I'll show you the Fort Severn because it's really interesting for orthography. Fort Severn sits on the border between Ontario and Manitoba and it's a good example of the difficulties that we have sometimes with orthography. So um, the syllabic spelling system um, has a dot that represents the W. It's called the W dot. And usually people in Ontario put it on the left, like in Quebec. But when you cross the border to Manitoba, they put the dot on the right. Um, the Waterways News put the dot on the left. So if you take a word like, uh, I don't know if you all see my screen here. Maybe it's a bit small. Let me make it bigger. Like uh, Wabush, which is a, 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 a hare, a rabbit. You see that the dot, you see a dot here on the left? That's for the W, and that's the A. The dot on top, or also called the pointed syllabics, the dot on the top means that it's a long vowel. Um, the other way to represent the dot on, on top is the hat over the A. The W that you see in the word wabush written in Roman is the dot that you see on the left on the syllabics. And then you see this little symbol here is called the final. It's for something that is not a syllable. And what people are using in Ontario is the Western final. So you guys in Ontario, you do a cross of the W on the left, W dot on the left, which is more like Eastern Canada, and then the finals, which are Western finals. Um, except Moose Cree, that, that is more Eastern than probably the influence. They, they're closer to Quebec. So, But when you cross the border to Manitoba, notice of the R, ah, is the same, but the W that you see for Wabush, they put it on the right, okay? And so what we ended up doing for this dictionary is to actually give both uh, spelling. So I'm going to look up, this is still a beta version, it was just published last June, but, um, and I can type double vowels, they're the same as a, as a long, but I should be able to find it. Okay, so here's a bunch of words that have the wabush in there. Okay, um, 
and say, so what we ended up doing for this dictionary is to give the spelling in bold, which is the standard for Ontario, and the one on the right is the spelling that is influenced if you're close to Manitoba, because this is what the Plains Cree and the Woodland Cree are using, and possibly the Swampy in the other part of Ontario. Okay. Now, notice how the little sh symbol here is this tiny little u, but if you were uh, looking at a Moose Cree dictionary, like the Spoken Cree Glossary. So Spoken Cree is a website where um, I have assembled all the material developed by Doug Ellis, who is, uh, you can see a video of him here. He was born in 1923 and lived in um, Cree territory in Ontario in the 50s. He, were, he first went there in 47, and he has this amazing collection of materials. So we have oral stories that you can get from here, and all the recordings that go with his books, uh, Spoken Cree books. But we also have a, a glossary, to which we're adding more stuff as well. And, um, oh, and of course, we don't have syllabics here, so it's not, no point uh, discussing that. Yeah, yeah, we didn't put the syllabics in the glossary, so. Okay, let me go back to the syllabics, excuse me. So what I wanted to tell you is that um, here I'm going to put on the screen a syllabic chart, which you can also download from the Linguistic Atlas. So um, I, I said that the W for Swampy Cree in Ontario is the dot on the left. The long vowel is the dot on top. But when you get to the finals, you see the finals that they're using. So uh, we saw the little SH which here is this, are, are, they're different than the finals being used in the Eastern. So if I take my other chart, just give me a minute. Do you see the Moose Cree chart? You can also download all that, okay? When you see the Moose Cree chart, you see that those little finals here are different. So that's another way for you to maybe tell which, where is the text from if you have material and you're not sure, right? You could use the chart to try to see. Now, it doesn't mean people have always been consistent in writing this way, but typically the Moose Cree, the L dialect, Lutin, they're using the same finals as the East Cree in Quebec, whereas the N dialect, the Swampy Cree, which is the dominant one in Ontario, will, all the, the syllabics will be the same, but they will use here the um, Western finals. Any questions about that? It might be a bit confusing. Maybe I want to say also there is an exact correspondence between a standard syllabic and a standard Roman. Now, if you look at syllabic charts, like the one put out by the Muskego Cree Council and everything, what has happened in recent years, and Alan will explain that to you as well, is that people who do not master the standard orthography then try to write their language using English vowels. Now, the choice of English, if they, had, if they were using French vowels, it would be a little better, because at least French vowels don't change under stress. But to use English vowels is extremely problematic, because as you know, you can never know how the vowel is going to sound. So what they, for, for example, for an E, they're going to write a double E, double E, E, for this sound here. They're going to write E, right? And so on. So you kind of need to get used to what people are doing to understand uh, and analyze the material you have in your libraries. Um, okay, um, did I forget something? So, oh yes, so if you go to this wonderful little website, that's also a great resource, that's thelanguagegeek.com, where you can download keyboards and everything. This was done by Chris Harvey um a while ago almost 10 years ago he, you have examples of text right that illustrates also this use of finals and uh the double the diacritic you see that in traditional text while people write the dot on the left they do not write the dot on top and that's typical of old text like the bible and so on most texts will not have vowel length indicated do no dot on top and some people are fond of that. Again, the Mushkego Cree little charts or all those charts that are produced, you know, for uh, pads or for commercial material, they tend to also not have the vowel length uh, indicated. So in other words, people will write this, these, two, these two things 
with the same character ignoring the dot. It's a bit like writing French without putting the accents, right? You need to know the language pretty well to know how to pronounce that because uh, the words could be very different. So there are some examples there where you can see a uh, plain scree, a uh, moose scree, that's, uh, and then here is an example of pointed syllabics where you see the dot on the top, that's where you mark vowel length. Pointed always means the dot on the top. Okay, um, what else can I show you? I think that's, that's pretty much it. So this, I wanted to talk about uh, what is called Nishnabebi uh, Gewin. In our language, we call it uh, writing in Nishnabe or Ojibwe writing. So I just pulled this map off the uh, internet, and it's it's somewhat inaccurate in the sense that uh, it should be further extended. The, it's supposed to represent the red is supposed to represent where Nishnabe Mwen is spoken. So, of course, you could extend that further out into the plains for uh, Soto people as well. And extend it further south, like uh, when you go to Curve Lake area by Peter Peterborough. And uh, I don't know if anybody's still speaking uh, Ojibwe or Anishinaabe when down by uh, Alderville and Hiawatha, which is by the Bay of Quinty area. And then also the Mississaugas of New Credit and then uh, Sarnia. There are speakers at Saugeen and Walpool Island, and then in through Michigan. So, of course, uh, the, the Anishinaabe people, the Ojibwe people, are actually known more for their pictography, uh, the pictographs that are all around the lakes uh, on cliff faces, and then also the petroglyphs that are carved into uh, places out in Manitoba, White Shell Park, as well as uh, by Peterborough Petroglyph Park. But here, the uh, missionaries, when they came here, they, they wanted to render our language in the Roman uh, uh, alphabet. So they started and they had uh, what we would, what I have just termed, I don't know if anybody's actually called it this, but it's uh, French-inspired Jesuit orthography. So they, they had a system that was, uh, that I find is, is quite regular and it's, it's easy to, not, I shouldn't say easy, but it's easier to read than the English one. So for example, this is taken from a little catech catechism uh, book that was published by the Jesuits and it just says get dead the Bajimowin and you see that uh, e, the E sound always represents here in this orthography the long E sound that we use. You see the E there is always represents that sound E. It doesn't represent the short sound I and uh, that's what the the only problem with the French Jesuit orthography is they don't indicate the vowel length of the I's, the A's and the O's. So one of the famous examples when you read a, a dictionary such as one written by Bishop Baraga that a lot of people use still is called the Ojibwe Dictionary. And uh, if you see the word N-I-B-I-S-H in the dictionary, you can't tell if it's the word Nibish, which means a leaf, or if it's Nibish, which means water. So if you don't know the vowel length, then you, you actually could uh, mix things up. So, in, uh, they wanted to make this uh, standardized orthography here, and I can read it, but when I find a word that I don't really know, I have to puzzle over and sound out uh, using two, using the vowels, long vowels or short vowels. So, for example, it says, Get the Bajamoin, and you see, Gi Ojit Tong Ake, where I'm pointing, and that means the earth was made. Or he makes the earth and then apaje. So that first a in this instance, a is a long a sound. Apaje, wayeshkat. And then the second wayeshkat. Instead, of, I don't say wayashkat. We say wayeshkat. Kawin, bapish. So I just know these words, and that's why I'm able to read it. But if I didn't know it, I would be mixing it up. I might say apaje instead of apaje. Wayeshkat, wayashkat. Kawin instead of Kawin, and then Bapish instead of Bapish. So anyway, there, this, the problem with the French orthography is you have to know the vowel lengths and the word so that you know to say 
E, like Kawin, or the I, or Kawin. So sometimes there will be a win there. But what's worse, the Anglicans and the Methodists, of course, didn't want to use anything that the uh, the Jesuits had used, nor did they want to use what the what the French had used. So they had to devise their own uh, orthography. And the the fellow here mentioned on the side or pictured on the side is uh, Peter Jones, who was a Mississauga uh, Ojibwe Anishinaabe person who was uh, alive in the eighteen 18, early 1800s, and he died around 1860. But he became a Methodist, and he uh, started translating the Bible and translated numerous hymns that were actually still used today. And he knew, and he was a contemporary of uh, James Evans, the fellow who is credited with uh, making the uh, Cree syllabary. But he also made, uh, James Evans also made an orthography, or he actually was saying that he was improving upon Peter Jones's orthography. I'm currently studying how, what modifications he made or what, what changes he made, but it seems like uh, Jones's orthography was then modified by a fellow named Pickering, and then others used it and, and were able to get their materials published. So the, the top headline of this is O Minwajmoin O Saint Mark. So the Gospel of Mark and Minwajmoin means uh, gospel. Well, it doesn't mean gospel. It means uh, good news or good good report, good tidings. So you see those four O's that's actually, and the hyphen is used there, we would say O instead of uh, like the, it's analogous to cooperate in English where you have two O's, but uh, sometimes separated by a hyphen, where you have two vowel sounds abutting each other and you need to separate them instead of making it sound like boo or coo. You don't say cooperate, well you do in a different word, but cooperate. Anyway, uh, the next word is gi eje majesi nene. So that's the the other thing is you got to figure out now is when they use the A. So if I go to this number two here and it says D-E-B-I-S-H-K-O-O, -O, the bishko. So here he's actually using, now how we would write this is D-I-B-I-S-H-K-O-O, -O, Dibishko, meaning just like or the same. But for whatever reason, they used the letter E to be this, represent the same sound as the letter I now. So if you see the next word there that I'm pointing at, Ezbigadek, and that A, the letter A there, is actually what we now use the letter E for. So that first a Z H I E, we actually use is now Eje, Eje B Egadek, how it is written. So that's why now what you have is we have uh, how Ojibwe is spelled three or four different ways. So using the current orthography, we would spell Ojibwe, and we're mispronouncing it when we say Ojibwe. We should say Ojibwe, O J I B W E, Ojibwe. But since they use this letter A, that's why people say Ojibwe, and then others spell that O-J-I-B-W-A-Y to try and represent that A sound. And it was these Anglicans and Methodists that introduced all that confusion. And then, of course, you got the Americans who say Chippewa. It's all the same word, Ojibwe, but they, they all messed it up because they wanted to spell it their own way. So that's what ends up happening is you get uh, three different writings, uh, spellings for one word. And on Manitoulin Island here, we have a, a place called Manitouaning. And uh, it was spelled by the Jesuits, as you see in the first column, Manitouaning. And then the Anglicans, instead of the one A, they use A-U, Manitouaning. And now how we would say it and spell it in the Fierro system, we'd say Nidowaning. So we actually pronounce it differently. Instead of the D, I mean, instead of the T, we use a D, Nido. And then others would say, Manido Wani. So likewise, the next place is Wakwimakong, and everyone calls it Wiki, Wakwimakong. And then you see how the Anglicans spell it with a W-E-Q-U-A, and that Q-U would, would be K-W. And then now how we would actually say it is Wikwemkong. And... Uh, you, you see that the first, our double vowel orthography, we don't say wiki, we say 
we quen kong and we quet is a bay and uh, similarly what happened here uh, there used to be a reserve called sucker creek here on manitoulin but the old uh, Nishnabe name was on dek wamanakaning and so they, the jesuits spelt it uh, a n d e g which is on deck which means a crow and then you see it's w a so i wasn't never sure if that was a long a sound or a short a and then minakaning if it uh, and i knew conning was a long vowel sound but you see the Anglicans wrote it differently and now actually I know that, that that A that I was puzzling over is actually a long sound so on deck Wamanakani an elder from their community who still spoke Ojibwe uh, told me that that's what the word is on deck Wamanakani the place of the crow where the crows spawn so the Jesuits there's another town a non-native town here called Mindamoya and so the Jesuits wrote, wrote it this way Mindimoye and then the Anglicans wrote Mindamoya, so you see that Y A at the end, and that's why people pronounce it Mindamoya. But the actual word we say it means old lady, old lady in Ojibwe is Mdimoe, Mdimoe. So it, you see how important, or basically what I want to stress to you is, is how important orthography or writing systems are, because you end up mispronouncing words and then you change the pronunciation and then you lose the meaning of the word. So another famous place here in Ottawa, I mean in Ontario, is Nottawa Saga. And the Jesuits spelt it Nottawa Saga. And uh, the Anglicans use, instead of a D, they use two T's. N-O-T-T-A-W-A-S-A-G. And now you see they actually shortened the word to Wasaga Beach. But it's actually Nottawa is our word for the Haudenosaunee people, Six Nations people, Nottawa. Nottawa Saga, where the Nottawa is appeared that's what our, our word is because there was a historic battle that was at that particular place where the Ojibwe people ended up uh, defeating them in that battle Nottawa Zaga where the Nottawa appeared where the Haudenosaunee people appeared so the other place that's famous in Ontario or I don't know famous but people know of it Petawawa and in Ojibwe the, the Jesuits actually wrote it B-I-D-A-W-E-W-E and then, of course, the, the spelling the spelling that actually stuck is Petawawa, but the actual word is be the way away. And that means you can hear it, the sound comes approaching towards you. And according to Basil, the late Basil Johnson, the word was be the way away, Jawang. You could hear the river uh, flowing towards you. Lastly, another example that's uh, famously mispronounced is Wawa. People say Wawa. And it's because, the, again, the Anglicans actually use that A, the letter A, to represent the sound E. So it's actually supposed to be we, we. And that's why they have that big goose there, because that's what that word means in Ojibwe. We, we means the Canada goose. So for a while, the, the words, our Ojibwe words were, nobody had a standardized orthography. People were, if you were Roman Catholic, you used the Jesuit orthography. And if you're Anglican, you use the Anglican orthography. And then we had uh, anthropologists and uh, linguists and uh, others uh, come to collect different uh, stories and legends. And I didn't put one up of uh, William Jones orthography, which was a phonetic transcription of our language. And he's pretty consistent. I'll show you if we have time at the end how we, we use that uh, his material on our website at chiging.ca. Uh, anyway, you see here that they, they use the hyphens here in the way away, not in the way away. This is the first, uh, I'm talking about this here, in the way away. And the way means how somebody sounds their language. Nanan is five, non the way away, it is of five sounds. One ki minnawa freedom, or I would think more like peace, peacefulness. Gin way way. Gin the way way, the sound is going away, non the way way. So there's a lot of different writing systems. And then I mentioned Basil Johnson earlier, and here he had his own, he, he fashioned his own writing system. This is an older book, it's a nice story, and it's uh, beautifully illustrated by Del Ashque. But you see here, they, they, what, when people are putting books together for children, there's different stories and there's different formats that they use. So what Basil Johnson used, uh, he would write the English on top. 
and then at the bottom he would write the, the Ojibwe in his own unique orthography which now that Basil has passed away I don't think anybody will use this it, this will be an obsolete orthography but I can read it is because I liked uh, Basil Johnson's uh, materials so I, I taught myself how to read his stuff so Beneshi Yuk Ogi Maunjedawok that's the first line the birds had a gathering Anishga what shall we do? They asked. So that's, uh, he uses the letter U and AU to indicate a long vowel A uh, sound, and then AE to indicate that E eh sound. So just different people were uh, trying different things. And then here on Manitoulin Island, the Ojibwe Culture Foundation has made different books. These are children's books, and they're Illustrate. This one in, in particular was illustrated by the late Martin Panamik, but it's why the beaver has a broad tail. So you see here they use the, little, the letter A, a mic, and then right here with the A, they use the A again for two sounds that are actually different, a uh and a. Uh. But then within here, de benang, they use that u. So I've seen other materials where they actually use the to spell a mic, they use a u m i k, a mic. So here you see the actual, and so muskrat agreed in the two exchange tales, mi sa ma ba. So here it is ma ba. Now we write that m a a b a, ma ba, jash kon. And so they use that capital N. To indicate the nasal sound so there's other things that are going on in our language that we have to represent um, and there's different conventions for that and here they were wrestling with how to uh, represent that nasal sound so they use a capital N here's another story that they produced one it was drawn I thought it was pretty cute with this fellow Nimkis and that means little thunder so it says here Nishke Maba but here, years later, they, they revised it, and they revised the drawings, but there's the same story. And uh, it's a graded reader for a younger reader readership. So, Nishke Maba, and you see Nishke Maba, and you see M-A-A-B-A. -A -A. So, these one, this one on the left there, on the right, is actually adhering to the double vowel or fiero orthography. Whereas this one on the left is actually an older vocal. Uh, uh, orthography that they were wrestling with and you see nimkis when you when you make a you got to represent that e sound the nasal sound so you see they have e e n i mean e e h n s and that represents the nasality but now the convention is n i m k i i n s and that when you see n s you are to understand as a student of the language or a reader of the language that it is nasal Nim keys instead of nim. I don't know how you would say otherwise. I'm just too used to saying it. Anyway, so this is how things have the change has, that has been made. But what happens is people want to write it the way they they think they'll understand it. And what ends up happening is a lot of people later on they actually see. Um, uh, they, they, they say, I, I spelled it the way I, it sounded. And they come back to it two years later and they can't understand what they wrote. So here, this is another book. This, this was a short-lived project by the Union of Ontario Indians. Uh, some of you may be familiar with them. They're called a Provincial Territorial Organization and they had a, started a company called Nishnabek and Daswan. And again, they adhered to, or they were adhering to double vowel orthography, but they didn't implement it. Uh, uh, they had some inconsistencies. They were, by and large, they were consistent, but they had some. So like you see here, the title, the Benjiget, Ga Jamiigwet. So technically, you, should, you would separate the Ga with a hyphen with the Je, Miigwet. It's a, the Ga is a past tense indicator, and the Je is a, referring to how, and Miigwet is a, what was given. So it's a story about... Uh, a woman getting pregnant so it's a simple reader as well but here this one is called uh, this was put out by sister vision press and it was written by uh, uh, a poet from uh, Cape Croker Reserve Neoshinagaming 
named uh, Lenore Kijik Tobias, and her daughter Polly Kijik Tobias was the illustrator. Anyway, I'm a I'm a fan of these two, uh, the the work that they produced, and they they got other books that they. She's a really I like the way she draws, and her mother Lenore does a good job telling the stories. Anyway, you see that when they marketed this, they said ages four to eight, but when you actually look at the text here. So it's actually, I don't think that's a, a age appropriate four to eight. I can't really see. I did read this to my four year old when I was when she was four years old, like uh, sixteen years ago, but. Um, I don't think she understood it, and it was a bit difficult to keep her attention with that much text. So just when you're recommending stuff to different people, uh, what we're wrestling with now with Ojibwe uh, production of materials is making it scaffolded as well as making it age appropriate. So, But what people tend to do is they make fantastic materials, uh, but it's all of it usually is way advanced. So you don't have somebody something specifically for grade one, grade two, grade three, which will be considered uh, primary, and then going to intermediate and uh, uh, these other levels. So you're uh, everything is to, uh, everything that is made seems to be made for everybody rather than making it graded. So that's what we're trying to do here in our particular project at Lakeview School here in Chiging First Nation. Here's a, a material that was made out by uh, Kenora area and uh, it, it's cute, it's computer generated uh, uh, graphics but you see they actually wrote three different ways now instead of just bilingual, well it is bilingual but they said I'm playing hide and seek with my son Ian and his friend Bunny so then they adhered to the double vowel orthography then goes this Ian Ge Niji Wan Wabuzo Sun Gaza Winan Ge Mikage Winan. So they they wrote that, but then they said uh, apparently the parents had said, I can't read those big long words. So they ended up choosing to write the words and break up the syllables and use the UHs and OHs and and personally I think the H and this is based not just on my own uh, uh, reflection, but also on an instructor named Marianne Corbier Nakogijik who teaches at La Laurentian University. That the H, when people see the letter H, they want to pronounce it no matter what. So then here, Nando, Da, they want to say Ndo, Da, Min, O, Min, Nin, Kozis. So you, ha you have this, they want to pronounce a hard H sometimes. And uh, when you want to use materials such as dictionaries or and even some people have the source, they're not going to be able to find any of these words as a reference as well. So right now there's a we're in a transition where we're actually make, trying to make materials that parents can use, that students can use, but we sometimes trying to satisfy everybody, we put everything in there. So we're using a double vowel orthography, we're using English, and then we have even this uh, this uh, orthography where everything is split up, broken up, and people may use it, and it's whatever people use or, or whatever they're able to process is, is good in the long run. But here's another project, this is at a, from a, produced by an immersion school out in Minnesota, the immersion school is called Wadukadading, and that means helping each other. And so they had an illustrator who, who drew this, but they, you see that they actually had their elders and uh, one of their teachers sit down and make this story. And again, it's a Mount Jitawin, a gathering, and it's uh, by the elder Eugene Stilday, Michael Sullivan, and Heather Fairbanks. And these people uh, assisted in writing monolingual texts that are for grade 4, 5, and 6. The story is targeting grade 4, 5, and 6, and you see how nicely uh, illustrated it is. So they said this one fella, young eagle was what he was called. He entered into the Nimadiwa uh, Gamik as the uh, dance hall. So 
you see we have a transition here and this is a this is Western Ojibwe dialect and in, in Ojibwe on Manitoulin we drop all these vowels and we they they call us here people east and west of us on Manitoulin so people at Kittagon ZB by Manawaki Quebec and then uh, people in Minnesota and uh, Kenora area call us vowel deleters in on Manitoulin so we, we truncate our words uh, and we, we shorten it and the process is called syncopation. But to me it just means we're, we're faster speakers but these, these vowels do show up once we, what they call, conjugate them. It's just like conjugation in English is uh, you learn the word run, running, ran, runs. So that's the same thing in Ojibwe. We're adding different things for different tenses and we add in these different words. These are, these are the kind of things that you I'm hoping that libraries would carry because there's a whole bunch of materials that are being produced by and it's all these little organizations poorly funded or inadequately funded I guess like libraries that uh, are producing these things on a shoestring budget and then they don't get wide distribution there's no wide distribution network for these items the only distribution network or forum is actually uh, one of the few ones is the Ojibwe Anishinaabe Ojib Tech Conference every that's held every year at the end of March. So that's where you're able to pick up a lot of these materials. And a lot of these older ones are now no longer produced. And I just bought them as I was uh, raising my children. I'd buy these uh, books. So some of these things are out of print and or collector items. And but it, to me, I always wanted to collect these things and then uh, uh, put them all together to create a curriculum or create a le learning program that uh, a parent could use with their child if they want to read to their child uh, before the, the child goes to bed or or even just uh, as an exercise. So on the that home screen you see it says chiking.ca and then on the banner there should be a word that's, I mean a, a key that says nishnabemwen. Scroll up. So right above the Thunderbird it should say nishnabemwen. Yes. Yeah, click that. So here's our, our web page and our our, uh, our product there and you see so you could see there's a uh, we adhere to the double vowel orthography. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if you go in there and you see does it say videos? Are you able to see where it says videos there, Marie? Yeah, I just clicked on videos. Okay. So then click one of the one of the videos there. And then you'll see one of the elders and there's a transcript and an English translation. And then you'll get to listen to the elders speak telling the story. <laughs> So if you can go back, Marie. So go to the next one that says archives. There's a tab there. So these are the William Jones texts. And he, he was a fox linguist who studied under Franz Boas. And he collected a bunch of tales from uh, Lake Superior area and Leech Lake and uh, Boy Fort. And there's Nanabush legends that we put on there, but the, the, we didn't process the whole thing yet. But what we were able to do is uh, put those into double vowel orthography. If you actually look onto something like archive.org, you'll see the original writing phonetic transcription that Jones did. And then we, we actually, some of these stories we have done them, we called it classic version, which was as Jones had uh, recorded them. And then we said modern, and we got our elders here today to mm -hmm. uh, any words that we they didn't recognize, we got them to modify it with changing the story as uh, trying to keep the story as much as possible and not interfere with changing the whole story or the whole word. So we, we changed them, and then some of them, can you see, Marie, that there's a, somewhat a, a speaker icon? But when you, librarians, when you go on this, you see that it has a function that says print page. So people can actually go on there and, and Ojibwe only column by column, which means uh, English on one side and Ojibwe on the other. 
and then also they could do yeah here we have column by column yeah column by column line by line and then monolingual mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Okay. Good. It's always good to show. <laughs> yeah. The real thing. Yeah. Yeah. So then that's the classic version. Then we, if you go to the other one, you'll hear a lady telling it in the Manitoulin dialect, modern Manitoulin dialect. So that guy, we hired him as a reader to do <laughs> that. So that's the kind of stuff that we're we're putting up on the web for people if they. Uh, if any of you librarians want to let uh, anybody ask you about Ojibwe language resources of the Manitoulin, North Shore, Ojibwe dialect, then we got a bunch of videos of elders speaking in Ojibwe natural speech, but we've uh, added in uh, transcripts so that people can follow along to develop their ear and then also develop their uh, reading capability. And then also we have uh, all those different lessons on that same website. We have... Uh, we we put we're we're putting up some audio books as well soon that are illustrated, and uh, I'm not sure uh, we will soon have an app up there, but we're not quite ready with the app. So I think that's a, about all that I wanted to talk about, and we're at we're a bit over time, so I'll stop there. If you have any questions, I'll answer them. Do either of you have any? Any last things to add? Yeah, and I mean, it would be good for us to hear uh, from the perspective of the librarians what are the kind of uh, requests they have or what are the difficulties they have. I think what Alan has presented today is really important to understand how to catalog material and actually the whole idea of revitalization, you know, uh, you got to be really careful about what kind of material are you using to revitalize and sometimes you will think that these books are from two different dialects but they're not they're in two different orthographies right. sometimes you will think that they're from the same orthography I heard of of OG Creep children in school being uh, shown uh, videos in Inuktitut just because it happens so that Inuktitut oh. is using syllabics right yeah. so that's not at all the same thing. So um, I hope that our presentation today has, um, for people who didn't know yet about those things, has um, given an, an, an idea of uh, a general picture of the situation. And I think I'm, I'm myself very interested and very open as a person who is developing resources for Cree to hear about what the needs are and, and what could be useful. Thank you for watching today's webinar, and thank you to Maria Zilyunker from Carleton University and Alan Corbier from Lakeview School in Chiking First Nation. For more information on today's topic, and for information regarding the websites referenced and the documents used, please contact Ontario Library Service North. Chimiigwech!